Hello, and welcome to Pax Britannica. My name's David Montgomery, and I'm the host of the podcast, The Siecla. The Siecla is about the period when the Pax Britannica achieved its greatest form, the hundred years between the defeat of Napoleon and World War I. Except, the Siecla is about the experience of France during those hundred years. While Britain spent the century dominating the world, its longtime nemesis across the Channel had a much more chaotic time. Revolutions, wars, triumphs and setbacks, more revolution, internal strife about religion and democracy. Above all, this proud nation had to come to grips with her new place in the world, a world with a Pax Britannica. Also, yes, lots of revolution. I hope you'll come give it a listen. Available wherever you get podcasts or at thesiecla.com. That's S-I-E-C-L-E. Now, back to Sam. Welcome to Pax Britannica. Episode 21 Rise of the Favourites. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. Back in 1603, the year that James became King of England and Ireland, he had been followed to London by a number of Scots. Most received gifts or pensions and ordered back to Scotland, which was quite sensible given the antagonism between them and the English, but some stayed. One of those remaining Scots was Robert Carr, sometimes spelled Kerr. In 1604, Carr was made a groom of the bedchamber, and so was one of those Scots that so thoroughly irritated the English-dominated Privy Council. If you remember, it was in the bedchamber that most of the personal contact was had between James and his court. This was understandable from a personal perspective. James was in a foreign land and preferred to spend time with what was familiar. From a political perspective, it caused no end of stress. It was not meant to be a foreign land to James. He was the King of England. The antagonism between the Privy Council and the Bedchamber would be a constant source of upset in James's government, and one of the most upsetting would come to be one Robert Carr. Carr was on good terms with the King for the first few years in England. He wouldn't be in the Bedchamber if he wasn't, but that relationship gained a new dimension, after a joust in March of 1607, where Carr fell off his horse and suffered a broken leg. Shame about the leg, but what Carr got in return was one-on-one time with King James, as the king took it as a personal project to nurse the young man back to health. By the end of the year, Carr, with presumably his leg fully healed, was the king's favourite, and was knighted and promoted from groom of the bedchamber to gentleman of the bedchamber. For almost the next decade, Carr would monopolise the king's personal attention, and with that came material rewards. In 1608, Carr was awarded one of Sir Walter Raleigh's manors, and in 1611, he was made Viscount of Winchester and Baron of Winwick. After the death of Salisbury, who was described by contemporaries as an enemy of Carr, but which we've seen has largely been dismissed by modern histories, Carr was promoted further. In 1613, he was made Earl of Somerset and took his seat on the Privy Council. From here on, I'll refer to Robert Carr as the Earl of Somerset or just Somerset. By all accounts, James hated the petition aspect of kingship, He doesn't appear to have enjoyed many of the public-facing duties of kingship, and the seemingly endless waves of petitioners was one of his least favourite. At one point, he said that if Judas had been on trial for murdering Jesus, one of his subjects would come forth to grovel for his life. Salisbury had diverted many of the petitions that were intended for the king, due to his great influence and importance, 
getting an audience with him was nearly as good as meeting with the king himself. His death meant that this diversion no longer existed, and so the Earl of Somerset became increasingly invaluable to the king. He became James's private secretary, and was one of the most important barriers to the king's presence. In his position, he blocked many of the petitioners who endlessly scrambled for James's time, further increasing the king's opinion of him. So, what exactly was the relationship between James and Somerset? This question requires us to look more broadly at the sexuality of King James, who often gets described as homosexual or bisexual. These words and our modern concept of sexuality would be completely alien to someone from early modern England, and so it's a bit anachronistic to try and apply them to James. That doesn't mean there's no value to it at all. It's unlikely that he was solely attracted to men, Queen Anne was pregnant at least seven times with multiple miscarriages that we know of. Duty to the succession only goes so far. However, it seems incredibly likely that James was, at the very least, repeatedly infatuated with young gentlemen, particularly the Earl of Somerset and afterwards the Duke of Buckingham. Whether either of these were sexual relationships or merely platonic is debatable. Professor Alistair Bellany, in his biography of Somerset, errs on the side of caution, and describes the relationship between the Earl and the King as difficult to assess, although he does acknowledge that James's love for Somerset is quite evident. Professor Pauline Croft, in her biography of James, is much more convinced that their relationship was sexual in nature. Whether they were intimate or not, in this relationship, Somerset was nowhere near doing his bit, no matter how much James doted on the younger man. Instead, Somerset was infatuated with Frances, daughter of Suffolk and wife of Essex. You may remember a few episodes ago in The Trinity of Knaves when I mentioned that Frances had something of a reputation and that it was going to get her in trouble. Well, Frances returned the affections of Somerset, and the two conspired to have her marriage with Essex annulled on the grounds of impotency. The king was all for it, but there were those close to Somerset who opposed this turn of affairs, namely Sir Thomas Overbury, a friend and advisor to Somerset who handled most of the day-to-day of his increasing responsibilities. Overbury did not like Francis for personal and political reasons. Her entry into his master's life would mean his own diminishment, for one thing. He wrote and distributed a poem titled A Wife, or alternatively The Wife, which explained the virtues that a woman should show before a young man rushed into marriage with her. It just so happens that most of these virtues were lacking in Francis Howard. Hmm, subtle. On top of this, Somerset passed on Overbury's comments about Francis' unsuitability to his new love, who did not take kindly to it. Aside from the personal element of these comments... Overbury had made himself a threat to her improving situation. She was already a member of one of the most prestigious noble families in the realm, but Somerset was clearly the rising star. Overbury had made a dangerous enemy. Overbury had also cultivated an enemy in James, who resented the influence this other man had over his new favourite. What James did next could have been based on his own initiative, It could have been at the suggestion of Somerset, and Somerset's suggestion may have itself been the suggestion of Francis. But James proposed that Overbury become his ambassador. Now that's all very well, that's quite an honour. But where will he be going? Well, would you look at that, it's as far away as we can physically send him. Overbury was to go to the court of the Russian Tsar. Now, Overbury was quite right in realising this would, by virtue of travelling to the other side of the world, completely remove him from court, from his position at the side of Somerset, and silence his opposition to the marriage. So, perhaps unwisely, he refused the honour. James was not pleased at this insolence. He already didn't like Overbury. And in April 1613, Overbury was imprisoned in the Tower of London for refusing the order of his sovereign. He would remain in the Tower for five 
months before dying of an illness in September. Or did he? The way was now open for Frances to have her marriage annulled, and James was quite happy to help. He was never jealous of the women in his favourites' lives, and at the annulment hearing, James interfered to ensure it was the result Somerset wanted. In December 1613, Robert Carr and Frances Howard married, with the spectacular wedding paid for by the king. These events had far-reaching consequences. Somerset was now wholly part of the Howard group at court, which was still not a faction per se, but now a majority of court patronage was in the hands of Howard family members or their relations, especially since Somerset continued to receive further titles. Essex had been publicly humiliated, branded as impotent, essentially on the order of the king. Francis was now seen as manipulative and power-grasping. This entire ordeal reflected very badly on the Stuart court, as well as on the king himself. More and more, the royal court appeared decadent, corrupt, and frivolous, with James himself making arbitrary decisions to his personal favourite's benefit. We'll make a brief divergence to the topic of foreign policy, As we touched on a few episodes ago, this was a matter of some concern on the Privy Council. With the marriage of Elizabeth to the Elector Palatine, James now had familial connections with many of the major Protestant power players. His own marriage brought ties to Denmark, his son-in-law was a force of his own, and brought his own links to Brandenburg, Sweden, and the Huguenot Duc de Boulogne. With these bonds, James helped mediate a peace between Denmark and Sweden in 1613, and his position as a Protestant monarch with the respect of Catholics made him a keystone in the delicate truce between religions. Back in England, Somerset began to make mistakes. From 1614, his enemies at court began to multiply. Queen Anne hated him with a passion, and his growing prominence and eternal presence at court meant she retreated further from her husband, even as her own health deteriorated. Her formerly glittering household lost some of its luster. It ceased to be the prime destination for England's leading ladies, and she stopped hosting her famous masks in February 1614. The Earl of Pembroke and the Archbishop of Canterbury were among those on the Privy Council who feared the crypto-Catholic sympathies of the Howards. Their tendency to favour closer links with the Habsburgs and Catholic factions in France directly challenged their hope that the king would look towards links with Protestant realms. Somerset's colleagues on the Privy Council also resented his monopolisation of the king's attention, and, well aware of their king's proclivities, tried to offer a suitable replacement. To this end, a young country gentleman called George Villiers was found and placed in front of James during his summer progress in 1614. James, was quite enamoured with Villiers, which was perfect timing for Somerset's enemies, as the Earl himself was beginning to get too big for his boots. Now he was married into the highest echelons of society, perhaps he thought his position was secure, and that he no longer needed to court James's favour. Over the next year, Somerset increasingly disrespected the king, often in public, He no longer showed the same affection to the king as he once had, even as James continued to shower him with praise and gifts. Parallel to this, young Villiers only rose higher, despite Somerset's efforts. He blocked Villiers' proposed appointment to the bedchamber, but instead Villiers was made the king's cupbearer. He served the king at dinner, where his manners and capable understanding of current affairs won him many accolades from the king. This was intentional, as Villiers had been coached by the quasi-anti-Somerset alliance. Somerset had only managed to delay his rival's promotion, a delay which had seriously ticked off the king, as it seems to have essentially been a tantrum. Villiers was nevertheless made a gentleman of the bedchamber in April 1615, granted a pension of a £1,000 a year, and was knighted with Prince Charles's own sword 
A few months later, Villiers visited the home of Somerset, ostensibly to patch things up. They could share the king. They could both be favourites. There was no need to be enemies. In response to this white flag of truce, Somerset threatened to break his neck. On that year's summer progress, James and Villiers shared a bed at Farnham Castle. This was a common way of expressing favour, and on its own doesn't mean that the two were sexually intimate, only that Villiers had reached the same level as Somerset had been just five years earlier. Now, whether or not Villiers had genuinely intended to parlay before the progress began, or if this was just a way to antagonise Somerset into making a mistake or laying his cards on the table, from here on, Somerset fell from grace so quickly there is still an impact crater in Whitehall. Bonjour, comment ça va? Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, it's that time of the year when people make resolutions. They want to read more, exercise more, or learn a new language. Clearly, I've chosen the latter. And I have Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, to help me. So, it's French for me in 2022. But like all of you, my schedule is already full. No problem. Babbel is fun, engaging, and it's bite-sized language lessons, about 15 minutes, are for real-world use. In other words, it's doable and practical. My two favorite things. And you know that you're getting the best with Babbel, as it was created by over 100 language experts with proven effectiveness, and its speech recognition technology will help improve your pronunciation and accent. And there are 14 languages to choose from. As I am a child at heart, I like Babbel's podcasts, games, stories, and videos, not to mention the live classes. But best of all, to put you at ease, there is a 20-day money-back guarantee. All reward, no risk. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code Recorded History. That's B A. B-B-E-L dot com, code Recorded History, Babel Language for Life. Earlier in the episode, I said that Sir Thomas Overbury, Somerset's friend and advisor who had opposed his marriage to Francis Howard and had been outmaneuvered into the Tower of London for his troubles, had died of an illness. Well, as it turns out, that was not the case. The story emerged that Frances Howard, with the complicity of her future husband, had had this stubborn adviser poisoned while he languished in the tower. And now, someone had talked. Someone always talks. James was shocked, or at least convincingly so, and in October 1615 arranged for a commission to establish the truth of the matter, telling Somerset that, quote, in a business of this nature, I have nothing to look unto but first my conscience before God, and next my reputation in the eyes of the world. The commission concluded that the tale was true, and Somerset, Lady Somerset, and their collaborators were found guilty of murder and sentenced to death. James was, however, nothing if not an old romantic, and he commuted the Somerset sentences to imprisonment in the Tower. The other conspirators, nowhere near as important as the noble instigators, were not pardoned and were hanged, including Overbury's jailer at the Tower. Francis Howard and Somerset remained in the Tower until 1622, after which they were released and lived at their country estates, far from the capital and the court, where they were irreversibly out of favour. Francis, as is the case with powerful women in this era, became the quintessence of female villainy, in the press, as Croft puts it. But while the coverage of these events was absolutely drenched in misogynist rhetoric, it does appear that there was a plot to murder Overbury, and Francis was part of it. Whether the king was himself involved in the murder plot is debatable. He disliked Overbury intensely, and while the Earl was in the tower awaiting his trial, James seemed very concerned that the Earl's testimony would affect his own reputation. 
promising a pardon if he would just confess and keep it to his own crimes. Much like the earlier scandal surrounding the annulment of Francis's first marriage, this tarnished the Stuart court significantly. After all, there were fewer people closer to the king than Somerset and his wife, and they had been found guilty of murder. And Croft sees the Overbury plot as almost a watershed for criticisms of courtiers, which Villiers would find to his peril. The other consequence of this trial was the complete removal of Somerset as a political figure. I mean, that'll happen when you're imprisoned in the Tower of London, which allowed the rising star of Villiers to take his place. Either before or shortly after the Somersets were convicted, Villiers was promoted once again, this time to Master of the Horse. This had all the material benefits of an office like this, such as the higher salary and all of that, but also meant that Villiers would be expected to attend each of the king's hunts. For a king like James, who had not lost his love of hunting since his early English years, this meant regular proximity to the monarch for extended periods of time without the endless waves of petitioners and officials. As much as anyone, Villiers now monopolised his king's time. This led to further advancement, and in April he joined the Order of the Garter, for Villiers' birthday, on the 27th of August, James made him both a baron and a viscount. How's that for a birthday present? He was offered the former holdings of Somerset, but rather wisely declined the honour. It wouldn't have looked particularly good to accept the leavings of his predecessor, but it wasn't much of a sacrifice because he was instead awarded £30,000 worth of land from the Crown Holdings. The final promotion Villiers received in 1616 was a position on the court of the king's bench, with a salary of £4,000 a year. If you think back to last episode, when we compared the income of the East India Company to the income of relatively ordinary people, it's quite clear how valuable being King James's favourite really was. From here on, Villiers' rise was meteoric. In January 1617, he became Earl of Buckingham. In February, he joined the Privy Council and then a year later he became a Marquess. From here on, we will refer to George Villiers as Buckingham, as even his final promotion to the rank of Duke will be to the Duchy of Buckingham. Buckingham will be a central figure in the narrative going forward, as he survives the death of James and plays an instrumental and highly unpopular role in Charles's early reign. Back in 1603, James had promised his Scottish subjects in Edinburgh before he travelled south that he would visit his kingdom at least once every three years. Perhaps his excuses for not doing so were sincere. Perhaps they weren't. Perhaps James was just really bad at maths. But he finally returned to his northernmost realm 14 years after he left it. Dr Jenny Warmold, in her biography of James, denies that this delay indicates a king who didn't particularly care about a kingdom that was neither as troublesome as Ireland, nor as wealthy as England. She highlights two occasions when Scotland was on the brink of receiving greater recognition as an equal kingdom. The first was in the aftermath of the gunpowder plot, when it was suggested that Prince Henry, as heir apparent, would be safer there than in England. The second was in 1607, when there were proposals to move the capital of England from London to the city of York, this would have been a much more central location to administrate the grand vision James had for a politically united Great Britain. Both had been strongly opposed by English officials and politicians, and James appears to have faced down a similar reaction when he proposed his Scottish visit in 1617. Warmold mentions a scene of courtiers, including Buckingham, on their knees in the bedchamber, begging James not to go to Scotland. I've wholly ignored Scotland since James arrived in England, and that shameful treatment will have to continue for now. I plan to look at Scotland during James's absence and his subsequent visit in the next few episodes, because the Scots were not just passive actors because their king was on an extended holiday in the south. By 1617 and 1618, the relative religious peace that James had helped mediate on the continent was rapidly collapsing. The heirless Matthias, Holy Roman Emperor and King of Bohemia, Hungary and Croatia, was approaching his end. 
the staunchly Catholic Ferdinand, cousin to Matthias, was elected King of Bohemia in 1617 in anticipation for Matthias's death and his accession to the imperial throne. The problem was, the Bohemian estates were overwhelmingly not Catholic, and feared that their new king would seek to impose his faith upon them. They were probably right. When Ferdinand dispatched two officials to administrate the kingdom on his behalf, Bohemian nobles captured them and threw them out a window. This was the famous Second Defenestration of Prague, and it kicked off the Bohemian Revolt and, as the conflict escalated, the Thirty Years' War. Why does this matter to our narrative? Well, one of the preferred candidates for the Bohemian crown, and the one who would wear it for all of a year, was our old friend, Frederick, Prince Elector of the Palatinate, husband to Elizabeth Stuart, and son-in-law to James. Once the Stuart regime gets fully invested in the conflict, we will return to the topic in much greater detail, but for now just know that one of the deadliest wars in European history has just kicked off. Also in 1618, James's desire for peace with Spain had lethal consequences for one of the recurring minor characters of the podcast so far. For the last few years, negotiations had been ongoing between James and Philippe III of Spain to marry Charles to the Infanta, Maria Anna. Both sides seemed to have been dragging out the negotiations, Philippe knew the Pope would not grant the dispensation that would be required for a Catholic to marry a heretic, while James was well aware that his subjects strongly opposed the match. However, negotiations achieved the aims of both monarchs, in that it maintained peaceful relations between their kingdoms. And that is when we get to Sir Walter Raleigh. Raleigh, had rotted in the Tower of London since his implication in the main plot at the accession of James, but on the 19th of March, 1616, the king saw fit to release him, and granted him permission to continue his career as an explorer and privateer. Part of his release was the promise that he would avoid Spanish interests in America, and so not threaten the negotiations. Raleigh duly set off to discover the fabled city of El Dorado, arriving in Venezuela. This is where everything went wrong for the English national icon, if the previous 15 years in captivity don't count. Possibly against Raleigh's orders, he would later claim at least, a fraction of his men set off under the command of his friend, Lawrence Quimes, and attacked a Spanish outpost on the Orinoco River. In this attack, Raleigh's son Walter was shot and killed, as was the Spanish governor. So that whole condition of his pardon, not antagonising the Spanish by attacking their convoys or settlements, or, you know, murdering their governors, yeah, that's going to be a problem. His friend returned to Raleigh and begged forgiveness, and when he did not receive it, Chemis killed himself. First, he tried to shoot himself in the heart, but the bullet was deflected by his rib, and so he then used his dagger to stab himself in the heart. After this, the rest of Raleigh's fleet abandoned him, while his crew grew steadily more mutinous. Once he sailed across the Atlantic, he landed at Kinsale, County Cork, and there the bulk of his party disappeared. Raleigh returned to Plymouth in disgrace. His son was dead. His best friend possibly betrayed him and then took his own life. The attack on the settlement hadn't even worked, and Spain was gunning for him. Oh, and he never did find El Dorado. Upon his return, he was promptly arrested. Reports had filtered back to Europe of his actions in Spanish America. James wasn't happy. The Spanish ambassador Gondomar wasn't happy. Raleigh himself was certainly not happy. He was transported to the Tower of London via Salisbury, where he met the king, who was on a progress. Raleigh's apologies and excuses were rejected out of hand. Once he reached the Tower on the 10th of August, he requested the aid of Buckingham, knowing he had the King's ear. Buckingham would hear none of it. He supported the Spanish alliance which Raleigh had so poorly treated. While in the Tower, 
he was interviewed by Sir Thomas Wilson, who described him as an arch-hypocrite. Raleigh was without friends or allies. Gondomar demanded that Raleigh's original sentence of death be reinstated. After all, he had broken the terms of his pardon. James agreed, although, depending on who you ask, he did so either reluctantly or without much fuss, possibly still suspecting Raleigh's involvement in the earlier conspiracies. Raleigh was summoned before the Privy Council on the 22nd of October. Here, he was accused of knowing all along that El Dorado didn't exist, plotting with France, betraying the king, and abandoning his men. Raleigh denied all of it, but the commissioners were already settled on his guilt and his punishment. The original sentence of 1603 would be revived. Raleigh would die. He went to the block with a calm confidence. Commenting on the headsman's axe, he said, This is a sharp medicine, but it is a physician for all diseases and miseries. Sir Walter Raleigh was beheaded at the Palace of Westminster on the 29th of October, 1618. His head was put into a leather bag and given to his wife, which is a bit grim, but better than going on Traitor's Gate, I suppose. In March 1619, Queen Anne died at Hampton Court. She had been ill for many years, suffering from gout and leg ulcers from 1612, and by 1615, her physician was concerned that she would contract dropsy. By September 1618, she was too ill to leave the palace, and Charles took to sleeping in an adjoining room in order to be with her. James, however, remained physically distant, although their relationship still seems to have been warm, even if it was primarily by letter. As 1618 turned into 1619, she was bedridden more and more, and her eyesight had begun to fail her. In the early hours of the 2nd of March, Anne of Denmark, wife, daughter, sister, and soon mother of kings, died with her last surviving son by her side. She was 44 years old. James was reported as being devastated, unable to attend her funeral due to grief fueled sickness, and so it was left to Charles to once again be the chief mourner at the funeral of a family member. His father had not attended Henry's send-off either, and Elizabeth was at the side of her husband fighting a war. Buckingham consoled both king and prince during this time, as well as doing his best to mediate between the two in the heated arguments that occurred after Anne left her estate to her son Charles, rather than to her husband James. We'll finish up today by mentioning a small rather innocuous event involving the Virginia Company. They had been approached by some religious dissidents, both in England as well as across the Channel. They wanted a charter to make a new settlement in America, and the Virginia Company was quite willing to grant them this charter, provided they agreed to some quite onerous financial demands. If they survived, which was hardly a certainty, they would work to pay the company its due. If they didn't, well, the Virginia Company was no worse off. For the company, and the government, whatever happened, there would be a hundred fewer religious extremists in England. I'm sure they won't form the foundations of a national mythology that will last for more than 400 years, right? And with that blatant foreshadowing, we will leave the narrative there. If anyone has any feedback or wants to keep up to date with what's going on with the show, you can find the show on Facebook and Twitter, or follow me at my personal Twitter handle, at SamuelHume10. Thank you once again to my House of Lords, the Royal Headsman, executed today, Her Grace the Duchess of Devon, Michelle Gersich, the Most Honourable Marchioness of Scullion, Lady Jennifer, the Right Honourable Countess of Surrey, Jean Buckley, the Right Honourable Countess of Shrewsbury, Elaine Dickens, the Earl of Oxford, Christopher Grogan, the Earl of Somerset, Brendan Bonner, the Countess of Cornwall, Belinda Clarence, and the Earl of Hereford, Christopher Remo. If you want to join their ranks, go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica. Every pledge tier comes with a personalised ad-free RSS feed, so if you're disliking these ads, there is an alternative. And the higher ranks come with extra perks. Thanks to David for the guest introduction. Uh, you absolutely should listen to the Siecla. I highly recommend it. It's fantastic. 
Thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for providing the music used in today's episode, to my entire House of Lords, and to you for listening. 